Grand Chief Somara says discipline important. Lay awareness on West Papua. And UBS loan inquiry not yet ready. This is the National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining us for Tuesday's news. The founding father of Papua New Guinea, Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare, celebrated the country's 44th independence anniversary at Imbongo District, Southern Highlands Province. His 44th independence message was to have discipline at all levels of government, public servants and disciplinary forces. Vasanatayama files this report from Mount Hagen. Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare calls for all works of life to have discipline. This was his message yesterday at the 44th Independence Celebration at Walum, Imbongu in Southern Highlands Province. The Grand Chief has a fond history with the people of Imbongu when he has visited the district in his early political career to nominate Imbongu MP Pila Niningi under Pangu Party. He was told to choose a location for the district office is to be built after more than 25 years and Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare was surprised the Imbongu district office was built on the location he had jokingly chosen decades ago. Grand Chief Sir Michael encouraged the leaders of Southern Highlands and Hela provinces to make use of the oil and gas minerals in the area and use the money for development. The Grand Chief also called for Papua New Guineans to stand in solidarity and work together for the betterment of the country. Six more years before the country turns 50 years old and Sir Michael's wish is for PNG to appreciate getting independence on a golden plate. The people of Imbongu gave cash and kind to the Grand Chief as a token of appreciation for getting independence. Vasinata Yama, National MTV News, Mount Hagen. The Prime Minister's Independence Ball was held overnight to conclude independence celebrations. Held within the precincts of Parliament, the occasion provided an opportunity for the Prime Minister to engage with business houses and development partners to promote closer collaboration. The Prime Minister has made it known that he wants to see this event become a part of official independence celebrations in years ahead. To conclude independence celebration, the independence dinner was filled with fun and entertainment. Prime Minister James Marape was there to engage with business houses and stakeholders, while local artists providing entertainment. The Prime Minister said it is important to engage with development partners in encouraging friendship, adding that he wants this occasion to become an annual event. Uh, what eventually should be uh, Prime Minister's uh, dinner night, whether I'm in office or not, but hopefully this becomes a culture where at the end of every September 16th in the evening you have a dinner like this and we get to meet our business executives and our invited dignitaries amongst us here in Port Mosby and in the country. So thank you very the much. The Prime Minister acknowledged the country's challenges as a nation after 44 years. Amidst many of the challenges that we go through in life, 44 years since, 1970, since our first independence in 1975, to me, is a lifetime. But by any measure, in, in terms of global standard of a country's life, we are just but a new country speaking in terms of our, our independence. He said the country's greatest success is the ability to stay together as one nation for 44 years. And amidst many of our successes and failures, my, my view I hold close to my heart, our greatest success thus far is our ability to stand together as one united nation, a nation of a thousand tribes blending together. And let me pay my respect to all tribes in our country. The Prime Minister also thanked the people of Motukoita and the landowners of Port Mosby for allowing the government of PNG to be established on their land. And those of you from the Motukoita tribe who are here, thank you very much for your kindness in allowing us to be partakers of blessing from your land. 
the first settlement of white contact here ensured that government resided here, business resided here, and our country continues to grow from the presence of administration here. So let me pay my respect as I speak to the people of Motukwaita. In line with the country's national celebration, dinner was local PNG cuisine, with fireworks to end a day of celebration for the country's 44th independence. Rayon Lakingu National, MTV News. Andrew Pui is a West Papuan who has lived in Papua New Guinea for many years. Today, Mr. Pui said the West Papuan community in Leh were part of the independence celebrations at Eriku, raising awareness on the West Papua issue. Mr. Pui says Papua New Guinean leaders should stand together and address the West Papuan issue because PNG and West Papua share the same island. So I think um, for us here, people back home are coming out boldly. And for us here in Papua New Guinea, we're stepping out also to support the issue. So I'm, I'm speaking as a single West Papuan who has been um, here as part of the uh, move of people you know, way back more than 50 years ago. And I'm one of the products standing here. The second mention of the Commission of Inquiry into the UBS loan that was supposed to be held today has been cancelled. Chairman Sir Salamo Injia made this announcement today. During the first mention on 2nd September, it was announced that administrative arrangements to secure resources required for the inquiry are continuing and if completed on time, the Commission would hold its preliminary sitting today. The chairman said the commission is unable to sit today because only a portion of those administrative matters have been addressed. You're with National MTV News. Stay tuned. We'll have more after these messages. Welcome back. On the eve of the country's independence celebrations, the Public Employees Association held its National Congress. Through the theme Promoting a Healthy and Effective Public Service, the Congress brought together provincial executives to discuss issues relating to this public sector union. Provincial PA presidents from around the country gathered at Gaire recently for the Public Employees Association and National Congress. The occasion, an opportunity to provide the pathway to PEA's focus for the next three years. The opening discussions included addresses from various stakeholders, including the Department of Personnel Management, its Deputy Secretary acknowledging the progress being made in regards to discussions between the PEA and DPM in recent years through award agreements, the most recent which expires this year. Once the current award agreement expires this year, the PEA has shown restraint in not making demands on the government for un unsustainable pay rises because of the severe cash flow constraints. So we can see that the partnership established between the public sector unions and the government have proved to be of great value in these different time, difficult times. Whilst the PA has embarked on planning for the next three years, its president, Robert Kutapai, has acknowledged a key focus area for this public sector union in promoting an effective public service, something which he says the PEA will work towards. Productivity and efficiency in the public service is still being addressed after 44 years of independence, and the public administration of this country is still at the crossroads. Attempts to revitalize the public service and re reinvent the will of the public administration has been fertile with no tangible outcome to escape public scrutiny and criticism. 
The Congress was also reminded of their responsibilities with Industrial Registrar Helen Saleo also addressing the occasion. According to Ms. Saleo, the PEA needs to ensure that its rules are compliant with its constitution with improvements expected in efforts to promote a more efficient public service. In order to be successful, we must also ensure that our public servants are skilled and properly resourced in order to deliver the promises of the Papua New Guinea Vision 2050 direction for the country to attain our dream to be smart, wise, fair, healthy, and happy society by 2050. In order to do that, ensure that your rules and constitution of the Public Employees Association comply with the law, the Industrial Organizations Act. Merbatulo, National MTV News. The inaugural Sogeri Floriculture Show was launched over the weekend, showcasing the variety of floras nurtured and grown in the mountain ranges by local women who have gone through skills training and floricultural workshops to improve their skills in the arts. The launch was officiated by Central Province Governor Robert Agarobe, but the people of Sogeri had even more reason to celebrate when Prime Minister James Marape paid a surprise visit to the show. The Prime Minister's presence did not go unnoticed as Sing Sing groups paved way for his arrival at the show. Floriculture or flower farming is a discipline of horticulture concerned with the cultivation of flowering and ornamental plants for gardens and for floristry, comprising the floral industry. The development via plant breeding of a new variety is a major occupation of floriculturists. Expressing appreciation, Central Governor Robert Agarobe stressed also the importance of such shows, which can be seen to drive in revenue and bring in income for the handiwork of local women. With this first show here, we come up because this is very, very important to us. We need to have start promoting a lot of these shows. So part of the plan was Miss Salim, our administration here to come in and communicate, uh, to talk with the uh, locals here to see how we develop these products and how its sector helps is to start driving these, these sectors. So I want, I want us to have a flor floriculture show every year here on a fixed date, on a fixed date. Further to making sure the current government was committed to helping local SMEs in the country, Prime Minister Marape and Governor Agarobe together pledged a commitment of 200,000 kina to assist women in Sogari enter into the floricultural business. Office Lomina, uh, Governor Grobe will look for 100,000 100, kina. Abla Salim Khan. Long supportive walk long Yibla get a line, go through. But me like, me like putting this like one kina go inside through Mama Bank. Uh, Yibla, get a line. Yibla, stop here. Get yourself organized properly, open an account, and get into doing business. Encouraging the people to get in the mindset of building their own business, part of the government's aim is to have half of PNG's population engage in some sort of business by 2030. Encourage every citizen. Part of aim block government blame me. By 2030, by 2030, me like him half of Papua New Guineans, you engage in agriculture, you engage in business, some business in our own country, instead of sitting a complaint of online camp kissing country go business. Anit Kora, National MTV News. Delivering quality health services to people in Green River LLG, Vanimo, continues to be a challenge, according to Officer in Charge Rodney Turkelang. This is due to its remote location. Eight posts in the district have also deteriorated, and nine of these 14 aid posts have been shut down. The Green River LLG has 14 aid posts and this sub-health centre. 
Since nine of the eight posts closed down due to rundown facilities, some of the staff are now assisting here at the Green River Sub Health Center. So we are four, and then most of our post staffs from from the post. I'm only coming up life because uh, issue with the post, the infrastructures. Officer in charge Rodney Tekilang has been serving here since 2015. He says it is difficult to provide quality health services for the locals because of the challenges they face. The distance and remoteness of the sub-health center is a factor that sometimes contributes to the delay in delivering medicine. That's where I suppose we got Marasin Lot. Enough stock lot, transit to me, Black Sika. Green River LLG is located in the Vanimo Green District in West Sipic Province. It has 36 wards and is home to over 15,000 people. Mr. Tekilang says despite the challenges they have in delivering health services, they continue to work. infrastructure, most of these facilities are long time only working. So, only come stop. Even we have the time best low, working more really well. So, we have no control over funds or such and things. How many people work and we play? Just, I'm not working with them. Lucy Kopana, National MTV News. After 44 years of independence, Lake Copiago District of Hela Province has launched its first ever health centre. Koroba Copiago MP Petrus Thomas partnered with the Australian High Commission and the Asian Development to launch the 25 million Kina Level 3 District Hospital. The project will serve more than 30,000 people, including those in nearby districts. The district has been overlooked for many years in terms of receiving basic services such as roads and infrastructure, health and education and a presence of law and order. Local MP Petrus Thomas told his people to appreciate this gift from development partners. The project launching was witnessed by the Australian High Commissioner Bruce Davis, representatives from ADB and several state ministers. This is Tuesday's news. We'll take a look at stories making headlines overseas when we come back. Stay tuned for the details. Welcome back to the news. Turning overseas now, winter has delivered little respite from a crippling drought in parts of Australia where towns face running out of water in months. Some could be dry as soon as November if there isn't significant rain. Once these men would have been walking on water, but the lake in Condoblin is now bone dry. The only source of water left in this region is the Lachlan River, and even that's due to run out in months. It's going to be tough, and it's also tough on the town. The people in the towns are struggling too. There are similar scenes all over the country. Winter came and went without rain. It's the fifth driest year on record in Australia. Water New South Wales is warning entire towns could soon run dry. That includes rural hubs like Dubbo. They'll have no water in two months' time. Condoblin and others will run out in March. Tamworth could be dry by June. And even Sydney's dams are beyond half empty. Just over two years' supply remains. This is a really tough time, a tough period for this state and this nation. In Queensland, farmers fare no better. This is what passes for a dam in Stanthorpe, where farms have long been cracked and crippled, and the people are struggling too. A lot of people have not walked in our shoes day by day to see how we're coping. We're not coping. At all. And to make matters worse, fighting bushfires in Queensland has helped drain what little water is left. Ahead of a hot and thirsty summer, every drop is sure to count. A guide on New Zealand's largest glacier says he's seen traumatic changes in the four years he's been working there. The 23-kilometre-long Tasman Glacier holds a third of all the country's glacier ice and there are fears for its future. 
Johnson is a glacier guide high up in the remote and awe-inspiring beautiful Old Aki Mount Cook National Park. So you can see in the shade here it's still nice and dense and blue. In the sun it starts to crystallise. He spends every day taking boatloads of tourists out onto the Tasman Terminal Lake at the foot of the glacier. After just four years, he's noticing dramatic changes in New Zealand's largest glacier. This is uh, the exact spot, basically, where the centre of the glacier was when I first started this job back in 2015. So we're looking about 500 metres distance here from the boat to the glacier. That's because the 23 kilometre long Tasman Glacier is retreating. As the ice melts, the terminal lake grows. This is a photo from a Niwa aerial survey in 1988, and this was taken in March this year. Scientists estimate that the terminal lake here is growing at a rate of about 140 metres a year. It's now over six kilometres long. Lauren Vargo and her colleagues at Victoria University are using aerial photography to build 3D models of New Zealand glaciers, including Tasman. The retreat rate has increased by about three times from the early 2000s through the later 2000s um, into this decade. Niwa scientist Dr Andrew Laurie flew over the glacier with a thermal imaging camera earlier this year and says it's apparent it's responding to temperature changes. When you have warmer temperatures you have more heat in the mountains and with more heat you have more melt of snow and ice and you start changing the balance of the glacier uh, towards where it's losing ice rather than gaining it. It's real nice. There's no denying in Will Johnson's mind what's causing New Zealand's largest glacier to shrink. Put it this way, you don't get too many people coming out on these tours and denying climate change, uh, especially after they see this. What the future holds for New Zealand's largest glacier, only time will tell. For now, Will Johnson will continue doing the job he loves, showing tourists the glacier he believes won't be around forever. Kiwi motorists have been rushing to fill their tanks today over fears of an imminent price rise. Two major oil facilities in Saudi Arabia have taken out more than 5% of the world's daily supply. The U.S. has blamed Iran, with Donald Trump tweeting the U.S. is locked and loaded. Iran has denied involvement but says it's ready for a fully pledged war. Kiwis rushing to the pump today, trying to beat a potential price increase. It's expensive as it is, man. I can't afford it. Yeah, it's hideous. It's really, really unaffordable. It is a problem, eh, because it's hard for me to even get to work. A major attack on oil supplies in Saudi Arabia, scaring motorists here and scaring the global markets too. Within seconds of trading opening, crude oil jumped almost 12 US dollars a barrel, the biggest surge on record before settling down to eight. So if that stabilised at that level in the next couple of days, we'd be expecting to see a eight cent per litre price increase come through them. The attack cut the output of the Saudi facilities by 5.7 million barrels of oil per day and it could take weeks before repairs are completed. New Zealand only takes between 5 and 10 percent of its fuel supply from Saudi Arabia and the experts say although the damage is extensive we won't be running out of fuel anytime soon. Stocks are quite high at the moment. The world has uh, got plenty of oil. The impact is clearly being felt politically though. The attacks have sparked an international row. Yemen's Houthi rebels have claimed responsibility, but the US is pointing the finger at their backers, Iran. President Trump tweeted today he believed the US knew who the culprit was and that they were locked and loaded and ready to respond if the Saudi suspicions aligned with theirs. But this president and his national security team and Secretary Pompeo, our nation's chief diplomat, keep many options on the table, particularly when it comes to retaliating against malign behaviour. 
Saudi Arabia has not yet blamed any party for the strike and is expected to tap into its oil reserves so exports can continue this week. Back here, fuel companies are watching closely before making any changes at the pump. Until we really see what happens in those international markets for the next day or so, it's hard for us to really understand what the true impact will be for our customers. But any changes will likely only be in one direction. The message for motorists tonight is to fill up sooner rather than later. Billions of dollars is being invested into rebuilding the Toku area hit by the 2011 tsunami. It came just weeks after Christchurch experienced its own natural disaster on February 22nd. It's a tale of two cities rebuilding together, but in two very different speed and scale. It's a mammoth line of defence, 400 kilometres of cement seawall, protecting Japan's vulnerable seaside towns from another deadly tsunami. It's been 80 years since a 9.0 magnitude earthquake unleashed a force of nature so ferocious that very little survived in its path. Almost 19,000 people died or are still missing in Japan's worst natural disaster for the locals, including Kiwi Cheryl Anderson. It's a defence line, yeah. The seawall is a physical and mental insurance. There was a whole big what if on my mind about will another disaster like this occur again, but they've prevent it, they've got prevention, they've got protection for everybody. The locals see these walls as a necessary evil because they worry about what it'll do for tourism. At a cost of 17 billion New Zealand dollars, they've been built to block out the sea, but on the other side, it's blocking out sea views and access that lures so many people to these towns. Billions more has been spent on rebuilding here. The brand new subway line, the backbone of Sendai City's public transport, took less than five years to build. And new roads reaching to the far north, homes rebuilt too, away from the sea, where the land resembles the empty red zone so familiar to Christchurch. For them to be able to know that, hey, we can move forward from this, we don't have to live like in fear anymore. Cheryl says she feels at home here, which is no surprise as Sendai has a strong connection to New Zealand. We deployed search and rescue teams direct from the quake hit Christchurch to help in the aftermath. As a gesture of solidarity, the Sendai government gifted this street lamp on the edge of Christchurch's Hagley Park. We also have that connection where people have come together because of what has happened. Two cities that suffered such a huge tragedy just weeks apart are rebuilding together. But in Sendai's case, it's at a speed and scale, unlike what's been seen at home. This is National MTV News. We'll have some sporting updates next in Chukai Sports. Stay tuned. Chukai Sports. Welcome to Chukai Sports. The 2019 Hockey National Championships ended yesterday at the Sir John Guy Stadium. Port Moresby Whites were declared champions in the men's division, while Palm Reds beat Palm Seniors in the women's division. It was a Port Moresby affair in the men's and women's finals yesterday. In the men's division, Palm White, consisting of many PNG representatives, took on Palm Gold, who comprise of up-and-coming players from Port Mosby Hockey Association. Earlier during the year, Palm Gold beat Palm White in the finals of the NCD Hockey Tournament. This time around, Whites were out for revenge. The match started off slow and gradually picked up pace. Palm Gold then began attacking and were given early chances of scoring after being awarded a penalty corner. Yeah, yeah. Yet White's defense blocked all their attempts at scoring. Yeah. Whites were given the same opportunity at the end of the field, but unsuccessful attempts on goal had the scores at nil all at the end of the first quarter. Yeah. 
In the second quarter, Gold had the upper hand all throughout the quarter with quick passes and shots on goal. Gold came close to taking the lead but we disallowed a goal few minutes before half time. The game got intense with the umpire dishing out seven green cards to players in white for dangerous play, resulting in a two-minute suspension for those players. The game remained scoreless, forcing the match into an eight-second penalty shootout. Whites went on to win three points to one on penalties and winning this year's national championships. <laughs> In the women's finals, the young Pom Red team beat Pom Elites 2-0 to win the women's title. Elijah Levet, National MTV Sports. The PNG Kickboxing Federation has some big events scheduled over the next two months. Some of these fights are the women's intercontinental title fight and lead the flash Garab to compete in a kickboxing fight which will be held in Kimbe, West New Britain province. So um, these two fighters have actually positioned themselves in the international um, title now and now they'll be uh, securing themselves for the um, continental title which is also scheduled for November 23rd and um, I think the event will be hosted in Kimbe, uh, West New Britain. Uh, the Prince government and especially the administration have taken on board uh, to host a big event up there so we will have at least about 15 international fighters also coming for the big show down there. Um, and uh, also we have other um, uh, promotions coming on. Uh, Lee Karab and his boys will be also having a show. Um, I think it's next month, uh, October. We also put in some of the fighters as well. Um, I think the more we have a lot of promotions and all that, I think we can really develop a lot of fighters. Um, and which I have been now openly invited a lot about. Well, my fighters now become the promoters. Um, while my position is just to really pro uh, develop them on a professional level, other minor promotions can be taken by them. In that way, it's a, it's a good strategy to develop them um, and expose themselves into a bigger major, and that's when I'm trying to take them uh, to the next level as well. So. PNG Volleyball Federation President Kila Dick says they will have to dig deep to restore the code in PNG. This comes on the back of a poor performance by the national team at the 2019 Pacific Games in Samoa. Volleyball are team sport that can be played anywhere provided there is a court, a net, a ball and of course players not more than six on both sides. While it's enjoyed and loved in the social, recreational and professional space of play, the administrators of the sport say it still needs improvement. When it comes to actual uh, competitive competition, there's only very few associations that are affiliated. Although there are competitions running at, uh, at different provinces, they're not, not, they're not able to affiliate. One of the biggest reasons is funding. Puts it up. Good drive. On the representative front, the national team, PNG Amoa men's and women's teams, haven't been the best this season. A reflection of their performance at the recent Pacific Games. Uh, we didn't play very well at the Pacific Games, and we want to, uh, you know, come back and start to uh, evaluate and, you know, monitor our performance from the Pacific Games and what was the, you know, situations that we went through, why we didn't uh, perform too well, uh, what were the factors that we want to correct and improve uh, going forward. There are, however, strides to improve the level of the competition and participation for the women's team. We're also planning to send our women's volleyball team down to uh, neighborhood uh, challenge in, um, in Canberra. Uh, that will be sometimes in November as well. Volleyball Fanatics volley on as the National Club Championships, Beach Volleyball Championships and Open and Under-21 Championships are played towards the latter part of September and October respectively. Bradley Valenaki, National MTV Sports. Don't go anywhere, we'll have more of Chukai Sports when we return. Chukai Sports. Welcome back to Chukai Sports. As the All Blacks prepare for arguably the toughest pool game they've ever encountered at the Rugby World Cup, Steve Hansen has played down the importance of Saturday's tournament opener against South Africa. The coach has gone as far as to say it won't be the end of the world if they lose to the Springboks and fail to top their group on Japan. 
This Springbok side is the biggest opponent the All Blacks have ever faced in Rugby World Cup pool play, literally and figuratively. This shirtless photo of them taken by their trainer sent Twitter into a frenzy. The game is so big, Steve Hansen is willing to show the world all his cards. You just got to use them up and keep finding new ones. There's never been a question before about whether the All Blacks will top their pool, but after losing to the box at home last year and drawing with them again this season in Wellington, there are no guarantees. You know, there's that knot in the, in the stomach. You don't know um, what their first one's going to be like, uh, regardless of how many times you've played an opposition before. Any nerves aren't because the box pressure defence has caused them plenty of problems recently. I, I don't agree that they've had the wood on us. Well, they'll be feeling confident, though. They think they've got a formula, and I guess we've got to prove that we've, we've learnt some lessons too. Do you feel like in some ways you might be having the upper hand at the moment? No, I mean, it's, it's rugby. It's a different ball game. It's a new game. The ball can bounce anyways. So. It did in Wellington for Herschel Yankees. Although if it happens again in Tokyo and the All Blacks don't win their pool, a very relaxed looking Steve Hansen's not going to panic. As we found out in 2011, you don't have to necessarily win the pool to get in the final. France did it the other way, so it's not the end of the world. Or their World Cup, as Saturday's mouth-watering game against the Springboks headlines a blockbuster opening weekend. Corey Webster has revealed he is prepared to buy out the remaining two years of his contract to bring an end to an ugly situation at the New Zealand Breakers. The star spoke for the first time today after his ongoing spat with the club's owners, who have refused to grant a release for Webster after receiving a big offer to join a club in Turkey. He's in Breakers uniform for now, but if Corey Webster gets his way, it won't be for much longer. Do you know whether you'll be suiting up for the Breakers in their first game of the NBL? Um, I'm not sure yet, I can't speak on that. Webster's been offered a contract by Turkish club Darusafaka. As it stands, the Breakers won't release him, saying it doesn't make sense financially for the club. But Webster is so desperate to leave, he's offered to buy himself out of his contract. That's the biggest offer I've had in my life. And because of my age now, it could have been the last opportunity that I would get to play at this level. Given his form at the Basketball World Cup, it's not surprising Webster's attracted interest. Although he admits the ongoing feud with the Breakers has, has taken its toll. Mentally, I'm not really in a good place. This is the first time I've kind of dealt with something like this, you know. Um, but obviously, I've been through a lot of my career and my lifetime, so, you know, I'll, I'll get through it. One player keen to see him stick around is new signing RJ Hampton, the 18-year-old adamant he can get the best out of Webster at the Breakers. He's going to be a big part of our success. Um, I'm, a, I'm a very unselfish player, so uh, I know I can really help him uh, put up numbers for the ball. Webster could be the latest in a long list of high-profile departures from the club, with general manager Dylan Boucher resigning just last week. Finn Delaney admits it's been a difficult time. It's tough on, on a personal level. We build relationships with people, and um, just like any, any work-life environment, um, it's hard, hard to see those people go. They'll be hoping they don't have to see another one go as the battle to retain Corey Webster drags on. Ollie and that ends Chukai Sports. When we come back, we'll take a look at the weather forecast for the next 24 hours. Chukai Sports. Chukai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. A look at the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in the southern region. Cloudy with a few showers in Port Moresby. Fine weather in Daru. Cloudy with a shower or two in Kerama and Alutau and rain showers in fine, although cloudy in Popandita. In the Mombasa region, thundery rain showers in Leh and Wau, mostly fine in Medang, Wewak and Manimo. In the New Guinea Islands region, mostly fine in Loringau. Fine weather in Kaviang, some showers in Kokopo and Rabaul, and thundery showers in Kimbe and Bukha. 
the highlands region a few showers then morning fog right across the region in Mount Hagen, Goroka, Kundiawa, Mendi and Wabeg. There is a renewal strong wind warning for all coastal waters. Strong southeast winds of 25 to 34 knots are expected to continue for the next 24 hours, causing rough seas and high wind waves. All small craft and boats are advised to take necessary precautions before and after going out to sea. Forecast for small crafts for the next 24 hours, waters of southern PNG, Indonesian border through Torres Strait and Daru, to Kiwai Island to Kerama, to Yul Island to Hood Point, Aroma Coast to Samari Island, with waters of eastern and western Milne Bay Islands, including waters of Samari Island to Cape Vogel, to Finchafen, also with waters of Finchafen through Vitias and Dampier Straits, to Siasi Islands, to Long Island and with waters of West New Britain, seas of 2 to 2.5 meters. Waters of Long Island to Karkar Island, Medang to Bogia, to Wewak to Aitape, to Vanimo and Northern PNG Indonesian border, seas of 1.5 to 2 meters. Waters of Manus and its western group of islands and with waters of East New Britain, New Ireland and Bougainville, Seas of 0.5 to 1.5 meters. A look at the ocean forecast for PNG areas in the Coral Sea. Seas moderate to rather rough with southeast winds at 20 to 30 knots. In the Solomon Sea, seas moderate with southeast winds at 15 to 20 knots. In the Bismarck Sea, seas slight to moderate with southeast winds at 10 to 20 knots. And in the Pacific Ocean, seas light with southeast to southwesterly winds at 10 to 15 knots. This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. And that ends National MTV News for today, Tuesday, September 17, 2019. On behalf of the National MTV News team right around the country, we wish you pleasant viewing for the rest of this evening on your number one to watch. Good night.